Welcome to our afternoon session. The afternoon session is about input, output and middleware. And the presentation will be given by Luciana Petro. So Luciana, please. Hi guys, I was talking to you later. So, uh, so yeah, so as Julian said, my name is Luciana. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here in the University of Reading. So uh, before I start my presentation, I just want to thank you, Julian, uh, for helping me organizing this summer school. In fact, it's the opposite. I'm helping you. And I can see uh, how difficult it is to organize such an event. So I just want to thank you for that. And also thank you for everything that I know about input output. I learned from you. And I hope you can uh, help me as well through the presentation in some details that I might not be too familiar yet, but I'm learning. And I, I think, uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. So we have here an outline for my presentation and we have an introduction, something about input output and then what kind of uh, IO solutions we actually have, uh, how do we measure IO performance, and then the main focus of this presentation, which is uh, talk about NetCDF, and that's the reason I, I want to make a poll. I will wait a little bit to have a little bit more people to make the poll. Then we discuss a little bit uh, of parallel IO, uh, filter re uh, research activities of the group, and uh, in general of this uh, area, of this field. So here, I'm not reading that, it's just the learning objectives that we have uh, in the web page. And then here in these slides, you can see exactly in which session those uh, objectives are uh, addressed. So if you have any questions about something specific, you know which session to go through. And then, of course, you can always ask me and then you can put questions in the uh, chat as well. So uh, this session is uh, a talk, so I will stay here with you for around 80 to 90 minutes. And then we have the lab. The lab is already in the summer school web page. It's a recording. So when I finish my talk, we'll have a talk from Sadie. Sadie will talk also about NetCDF, but with a different perspective. And we both have labs as well. So in my case, I have a lab with NetCDF working C language. And then in Sadie's case, she's working with Python language. So we will have both experience. Uh, and uh, the labs are, the slides are already there as well, because you have some slides specifically for the lab. And here we have the objectives that are covered uh, by the lab. So uh, in my introduction, let's talk a little bit about this IO bottleneck. So that was the first thing that I always, I, I, every single day I would hear someone talking about IO button, bottleneck. And I would say, why do they call like that? Okay, it's, it's lower than the computation, but I, I, I didn't have a very fair idea until I came up with this I, I came through with this picture. So this picture is not my picture. It's Cortez Cameron, and uh, it's a picture of uh, a supercomputing called Titan. And this picture show exactly what I int what I what I would expect as a bottleneck. So we have here values for computation, for node memory, for uh, the interconnect between those uh, nodes, and then for storage. And you can see that the difference of the values in computation to the node memory, when you can actually store the data that is being uh, created uh, from the computation, and in the end of the process, you have to communicate that data and then finally go to a specific storage. And you heard a lot about different types of storage in the presentation in the morning. And then you can see here that the difference is huge. So we start with computation at, at, at 125 petabytes per second, and then you lost two orders of magnitude when you go to node memory and then you 
communicate with different nodes and now you are actually talking about data not only the data that it's being produced by the computing but the data that is being uh, shared and eventually the data that will be stored and then you have this channel of communication here as well and then finally you have storage so you go through from uh, 125 in this example this is a, just a example for this machine so it's 125 petabytes per second to 1.4 terabytes per second so it's five orders of magnitude between what you can achieve with computation and what you can actually store uh, your data to analyze later to have nice uh, graphs and to make comparisons to make predictions so you can generate a lot of data but at the end of the, of the day you cannot keep all of them so you have to be smart about the data that you keep which means io in this case and also you have to be uh, smart about the data that you generate because if you generate data that you can never analyze what's the point and those machines they are expensive they are expensive uh, not only the hardware but they are expensive for uh, energy they are expensive for the climate that we are talking about climate change all the time so we should uh, think about energy consumption as well so this is a picture that describes uh, really well for me why do you have this io bottleneck it's because we can generate a lot of data today with computation, but we cannot store all of them in the same rate that we de generate them. Uh, and even this, just coming back a little bit, even this picture being a picture of a specific supercomputing, this is general the idea of all the supercomputers. You have different orders of magnitude uh, from uh, amount of data that you can produced uh, through uh, com computation and then the data that you can store. Here is a different now machine. Uh, it's a machine called Mistral. It's a machine from uh, Dikrezi, which is a center, uh, the climate center in Germany. And this, this was a study that they, it was delivered in 2015 and it's was about historical data of the machine, about the performance, the nodes, the, the capacity, and how that would, uh, how that was evolving during time, and what they would predict predict for the next uh, generation. That usually is just uh, every five years we change the hardware that we have. So uh, in that in that study, they realized that the performance would grow. 20 times but then again the throughput would improve just six times so if you want to store something you are worried about the speed that we can start that data you're again increasing the difference we are again performing you're again computing more and better but uh the speed if you are saving that they is not following up with the advances in, in computing. And here in this uh, right-hand table, you have the costs, which I thought is quite interesting, because you can see here that the compute costs in this specific case is 15 uh, million euros. Million? Yeah. And the network cost is five, okay, a third, but then the storage cost is half of the computational cost. So storage is something that you really have to consider because you are paying to have your data there. And if you're not using that data probably, if you're not saving the data that you actually need to analyze and to uh, develop your research, you're wasting money. So it's, it's really tricky. And to help the next generations, uh, not only the next, but uh, we are having that already. And that's one of the main reasons for NetDF that I will say uh, later. We have this uh, battle uh, between folders and metadata. So the idea is uh, when I have a file system and I search for a file, the file system has to go through all those files to find that file that I need. So we have a lot of, in this case here, you have a nice picture that uh, again was available online. You see some borrowed pictures in my presentation, but they have the reference. 
So I, I thought this picture was quite nice because it shows you that it's a really hard work to go through all that all those files that you have in a file system to find a specific file, to find a specific file. And uh, now that here comes the idea of metadata. So metadata is data about data. So it's what you can tell about the data. You don't have the data exactly, but it, you can tell things about the data. So if I'm sorry, uh, music, for instance, I would say the name of the author, the name of the, the, the date of the album, the name of the album, the length of the music. So if I have data about the data, I might use that information to search for my file. And then when I look through the searching procedure, it's quite easier because I don't have to go through file by file. I just go through this general information about those files, which usually is really uh, smaller than the size of the file and the size of the data that we have. And that's really clear uh, in the lab presentation because we can uh, inspect some NetCDF files, files uh, for climate and weather. And then you can see the size of the admitted data and compare with the size of the data and understand exactly what I mean here with uh, metadata will always be really, really smaller than the data because it's, it's just the description kind of. And we have so this challenge because we are advancing a lot with computing, but we are still behind in storage. And today, up to today, we, we have, of course, many initiatives in this idea of data-driven research. But uh, most of the place today, they still uh, have storage and computing uh, seen as a separate and, and two different things. So they just worry about, let's compute, let's uh, run my model, let's have uh, all, all the, the data that I, uh, I can produce with this kind of um, application. And then later, okay, now I have uh, 10 terabytes of data. Where do I store it? So those things, they should work together because uh, it's, there is no point if you generate a lot of data and then in the end you, you realize that you cannot store them or maybe you can store them, but you cannot store them properly, which means that when you need to search for something, you might have a really hard time. It might take you a long time. And if you are working with climate and weather and you're working with forecast, you, you don't need the information of the forecast for tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. So we need to be worried about those things. So the idea here is to have this type of uh, research that uses and combines data and computation at the same time. So I, I'm checking what uh, is being produced by the computation of my application, but at the same time, I'm paying attention where I would store that data, how I would store the data, if that data, uh, so we also saw in the first, uh, in the morning presentation, they were talking about uh, checkpoints. So sometimes you don't need to store all the data, but you store a checkpoints that you can reconstruct the data from that point. So there are many things that you can do to optimize what is being uh, generated with the computing and what actually is being uh, stored in any one of the stories that we saw before. So I'll go through now uh, a quick introduction for exactly input output so that was kind of just a motivation for the topic but uh, of course you had that motivation in the morning as well and we saw that there are some uh, intersections some things that uh, I will cover that the guys of course covered as well because you we are working again with the same problem we need to deal with the data and how do we start the data so when we talk about data, and I'm talking about computing, storage, computing, storage, that's just what I.O. is. It's just migration. So I have my data in memory when my data is being processed in the computer, and then I have my data now saved in disk, for instance. It's one kind of search. But the idea is to remove what was in a volatile storage, in a storage that is just being used to make the computations and that storage is usually quite fast and then save it and then I can analyze later and I don't have uh, 
that kind of storage usually is uh, what we call, I will mention a little bit later, as a non-volatile. So I can just uh, turn off my computer and then when I turn on again, all the data that I saved in disk is still there. But if I'm a computer, it's something that it was in memory, that memory was lost. So we write it that I always have very expensive uh, operation and uh, we perform IO using process and files and then the important thing is the characteristics of, about the file access so sometimes you want to store like we had for Ms. Strauss some historical data we don't need the data uh, from uh, 2009 at hand now from Ms. Strauss but it's good to have that data there. So we start that, but we know that we don't need to access that data all the time and probably not uh, even constantly at all. So we need to uh, identify what kind of uh, access do you want from that data and then you put it in a specific storage. And we call that IO pattern. So when you have that defined, that for this type of data, I will have this type of access. For this type of data, I'll have a different type of access. And then you can choose a different type of storage to save your data. And again, as I mentioned, IO is performed. In that case, it's just up to the system that you have, the computational system, the, the file system. But we will see a little bit later that there is a lot of other things that also uh, influence in uh, the performance of, of IO. We have an entire session for that. So here is just what a main uh, idea. So well, for I IO, just yeah. one comment from uh, the audience. They say, could you use the pointer to point out where you are in the slide? Right. The pointer I can. That you can use this pointer, you know, this hand, okay. to indicate where you are on the slide, yeah? If it's more complicated. Okay. okay. Yeah, so usually uh, my, my slides are quite uh, clean. I, I like to have just a few uh, words in this, in this slide. And because I know you guys will read it later, I try to put a little bit more than I usually would do. Uh, and sometimes I don't say things in sequence, so it's a good idea to have me pointing exactly when I'm talking, because I just uh, have the main idea of uh, what I want to say to you. And of course, eventually you can go through the, the slides. But thank you for the, the suggestion. So, uh, so the idea now, the general idea about IO performance is that uh, we don't have a solution for the I.O. problem that will be a solution for every I.O. problem because it depends on the I.O. pattern assets that you have for the file. It, it, it really depends on the type of application that you have, of the type of data that you have. So we need to uh, kind of, and that's what NetCDF does, specialize the format of the data that you have in a way that it will be optimized for the application that you have. And that bottlenecks can happen in different locations, not only in the, it can happen in the application, it can happen because of the file system, it can happen because of the hardware that you have. And there are, of course, some IO patterns that we know that work quite well, but don't try to um, use that pattern for everything. So uh, you just saw in the morning a little bit about uh, Darshan and how to identify some patterns for IO. And then you say, oh, that's really great for my program. And now I know exactly what to do. That will work for that program that you're analyzing, that application that you're using. And of course, sometimes we can extend that to different things, but don't think that will be a solution for everything. The solution for everything, I can say it, it's a golden rule that I just wrote it here. Increase performance by decreasing the number of IO operations and increasing the size of each operation. So the less IO that I have, the better it will be. So if I, if I want to trade, Everything that I'm doing, I'm saving, I'm saving, and I'm saving, and I'm assessing disk, it will be quite slow. And that's the idea of caching. So uh, the idea is the more I can uh, accumulate things and just do 
I know operation fewer times, the better usually is for uh, your application. But even this golden rule has the, the uh, how do I call, uh, the break, breaking rule. So you saw this uh, graphic uh, as well in the presentation in the beginning. So we have here the IO tower. I'll go really fast on this one. So we have serial IO, parallel multi-file IO, and shared file IO. So here the file has access just to this master node, this master process. And then here we every process has their own files. And here all the process can actually see and work at the same time with uh, a specific file. And like you can see here, uh, I, I I was studying and then I was looking at a lot of different presentations. And then, and then when I come to a picture that I think it's really, really nice, I say, yeah, let's give credits to these people who developed that picture. And then, of course, let's talk about the picture because a very nice picture. And the same here with this next picture. So I was talking about access patterns. So uh, I have different types, and I, I'm just going through some here to to give you an idea of what can happen. So again, I/O is about uh, migrating data from memory to file. So I can do that in a continu contiguous way. So my data is there in memory and contiguous, and then my file is contiguous. Perfect. That's the best of the world. But that I can have my data in memory in a contiguous way, but in the disk, in the file, it will be fragmented. That happens uh, when you have, for instance, a big file and then you don't have uh, a continuous uh, chunk of, of space in your disk. So you have to fragment your data. And then, of course, when you want to read that file again in memory, you have to go through every piece and put it together. So it's intuitive that that will take more time. But then you have the inverse, which uh, the data can be fragmented in memory, which means that you're using a lot of memory and you don't have a continuous part of the memory to uh, have your data all together. And then the file will be contiguous, at least that. And of course, you can have both situations, both discontiguous in memory and uh, in the file. And that will be the for the four ones, it will be the less uh, efficient. And then you have something that I call it bursting, and then you, you will hear about burst buffers uh, in the future. So the idea is that I have my data in memory, but I don't have to access that data all at the same time. So here I constructed my file, and my file is or completely here. Everything that it was in memory is already here. Here you can access this uh, green part in one time and this pink part in a different time and this orange part in a different time. So I can have a different pattern of assets because I'm not accessing the whole file uh, all the time. And that gives you the idea that I could, for instance, be using that to access just the metadata of the file. So the file is there, it contains the metadata, and then I just access the metadata. So I'm loading uh, really less uh, data. And then we have the other situation, which is all of core, where you have more data to store that you have in memory. It's like the idea that you are processing and then you process some part of the data and then you save it and then you process one and then you save it. So we end up with a file that is bigger than the memory uh, itself. And last borrowed slide, this one uh, mixed both things. So it's about file striping. So it's the idea that when I'm saving a file, I can have different situations. So here, for instance, I have this file, and I'm saving this file with different parts here uh, highlighted by the colors in different storage. So it's not only in the same storage as a fragment in the, that storage. So uh, it's in different storage. So uh, and that looks quite uh, inefficient at the same view, at the first view, because you just look, oh my god, there is a piece here, a piece there, a piece there, a piece there. But because now we have different storage, you have to keep in mind that you can process them 
simultaneously in parallel. So that might be uh, something that will help your file because now we are not constructing your file from a specific memory that you have to wait for all the pieces to come together. You have the pieces coming from different parts. So you can use here a, a different uh, approach to have uh, your file being reconstructed in a faster way. So this is related to both how do I store the data and also how do I retrieve the data. And you are talking uh, about performance. So it's really not one size fits all. We have to learn the situations. And when I came, when I first came to this picture, I said, why would I want to split my file in different storage? Oh, because now I can access them simultaneously. Oh, that's clever. So people from storage, they're always having some really, really good ideas. And sometimes it's even difficult to, to keep up with everything that they are doing. But let's, let's move on. Uh, so in that morning presentation, uh, the guys also uh, mentioned the IO stack. And here in the IO stack, so they covered that uh, quite nicely. But I insert here in the IO stack uh, a, another level, which is this IO middleware level. So they talked about um, the parallel file system, the application, the hardware, and then the higher level IO library. And they focused a little bit on that. And then uh, to be able to use Darshan, you have those four levels without the IO middleware. So what the hell is that IO middleware? So the idea of the IO middleware, it's exactly what is it? it is here. It's in the middle. So another level of communication from the parallel system to the higher level IO libraries. So I have here my application is running, my application, for instance, a C code and calls a specific library. And that library will go usually directly to my file system. But if I have this IO middleware making the transition, that transition could be make smoother and then I can optimize things from one side to the other, other than just go directly from the application kind of to the file system. So that's the idea of the IO middleware. Uh, the IO middleware also, uh, so th there is an intersection exactly what is IO where and what is a high level IO library because people sometimes consider and they quite uh, the same. One of the distinctions that I've learned is that uh, a library cannot live by itself. A library has to be called by a program. And I only the way exactly can do the job by itself, like in a specific program. So that will be the, the major difference that I've seen uh, by now. So Julian, that's something that maybe you want to add something here. Oh, I'm good. Please go. OK. So uh, that's the main idea about IO middleware. And we will talk a little bit about IO middleware further, because uh, that's related to the research that we are doing uh, in Easy Waste Project. So uh, list now, again, the IO problems. Uh, I have different capacities for computing and uh, storage. and the, the idea is that the difference is getting bigger and bigger. So I need to be able to work with IO uh, solutions. And if I can't do that, I cannot analyze uh, the, all the data that I'm producing. And then it means I'm losing science. And sometimes you have even uh, in climate and weather, you have things like resolution. So you have your data, it's perfect, and you can see a small piece of the data, uh, like for instance, uh, a city, then when you amplify it for a country or for a continent, you have to lose resolution because you cannot say all the data. So you should have that resolution to work with the best uh, data that you have. But if you are not smart about what you're doing with the data and how are you uh, saving the data, have what <laughs> more data than uh, you can store, and that's a trending that I, I, I don't think will will change sooner. And of course, as I mentioned before, we need to think about energy consumption because it costs a lot of power. Those super uh, computers. 
So I will talk now a little bit briefly about uh, I.O. solutions. So uh, as I mentioned before, we have those solutions uh, generally in three levels, the hardware level, the application level, and that's what basically you saw in the morning presentation. But also you have some solutions in the middleware level. So this level that it's between the hardware and the application. So in the hardware level, I, I don't need to talk too much because the guys quite cover everything. The idea is that uh, the gap is always increasing. So I will just, uh, I can see there is a question. I will stop after this session to kind of check the questions. Uh, if you cannot answer all of them uh, through, the, um, through the chat. I'm quite curious, but uh, I will go up just a little bit further and then I will stop to check those questions. I should have done that before. So I'm sorry, I'm just finishing this session now. So, uh, so in the hardware level, the guys covered uh, a lot, and the most thing is the NVMs. So we have no volatile memories that you can save things, and you don't rely on power to have them saved. And you also have, as I mentioned to you, bus buffers, which is some uh, intermediate storage. Sometimes it's seen as an IO middleware, but it's part of the hardware. So it's something that will will in, in a general sense, to organize your data uh, in a better way to go through uh, storage. And then we have solutions in IO middleware, which it will be something between the file system and, and the hardware. So sometimes they are in the file system in the hardware, and sometimes they are in the high uh, level IO uh, libraries. And here we have, uh, I just listed three. They are the most uh, famous in that case. So the Maris, uh, Adios, and Delta FS. And you can read a little bit about uh, them if you are interested in this uh, idea. But here it's time for me to uh, do some propaganda because we have, we are developing our own middleware for the Earth system data. So it's a middleware that uh, it can be for different type of data, of course, but it's specialized in climate and weather data. So this is part, it is a major part of the EZM, uh, yes, Easy Waste project. So uh, we call it ESDM, Earth System Data Middleware. And the idea is to improve uh, how to approach some uh, different views of uh, how IO is being addressed today. And you can have more information about, of course, ESDM uh, with, with papers uh, asking us and our specific presentations for the SDM. So here I just want to mention that we, we are working exactly in this middleware level to kind of improve the IO and to have uh, a better communication from computation and storage and what how, how do I choose those things and then we have the solutions in application level and usually a solution in application level it will be an in-situ analysis so we also have uh, uh, tools for that we will have that uh, I think tomorrow uh, afternoon we have some uh, tools for uh, visualization and the idea is uh, okay my data is there in memory it's not stored in a physical storage but what about if I just see what's happening there and, and take my own conclusions about what I mean and then I don't need that data anymore I just use that data and then I move on. So this is the idea of changing the IO in application level you kind of don't have uh, IO. You just look at the data when the data is being uh, processing and being generated by, by the system. So just to wrap up the major ideas here, there is no one-size-fits-all solution for IO. We need to be careful about with application, with the data format, with file system, with hardware. There is still a massive uh, difference from computation comp computing and uh, storage. And uh, here I just uh, shortly introduced to you three different solutions, uh, three different levels of solutions in a hardware level, in a middleware level, and then in an application level. So 
2.06 now in UK time. Uh, Julian, do you want me, do you have something specific that you want me to check in the chat? Should I just go through it? There are 30 I, on. I, I answered all the questions. I answered all the questions, otherwise I would read them to you, okay? Oh, you're so efficient. Okay, so um, is there anything that you want to, to mention, maybe for the recording? Yeah, okay, so there was the question about uh, what does it mean to have enough I.O.? Generally, the problem is that when you your application you want to produce some kind of output. And in this case, when you have like a time series, a simulation that produces a time series, for example, you have to make the decisions at which time steps you produce output. And when you do the analysis later, you, you need to access this output to generate further data products, for example. Of course, then if you output every 10 time steps, for example, then you cannot access the fifth time step of data. So it's kind of always a trade off from the application perspective what kind of data you want to store to be able to later access the data. In particular, it's true when you run very large scale applications for which such an execution costs maybe thousands of euros, a single execution, then you need to do really careful planning of your experiments, so to speak, um, to get the data that you need to do the respective analysis. Okay. So I, I can see there is a, so, so thank you uh, for your contribution, Julian. I can see there is a, a new question here. Diane is asking, why is it better, the file striping method? Again, I, I would say always better, Diana, because again, we, we need to be a little bit careful about that. But the, the idea here, let me just go back to this slide. I don't think I can do it easily here. Let me try. So, but the idea of file striping is that you are saving uh, parts of your data in different storage. So now you can access all the storage at the same time. So you can reconstruct, here is the, the file. So we had it here previously, that uh, scenario, and that scenario was uh, assuming that the file would be in one type of storage. So uh, to, ass to access, for instance, this file here, and to put it again in memory, I would have to go to this uh, uh, part here, and then this part here, then reconstruct my file, and then go back to memory if I want to access uh, that file. So I cannot do that simultaneously. I have to do one part and then collect the other part. And if you go to this scenario here, I have to do to take this piece, this other piece, this other piece, and this other piece. So it's like I will give you a silly example. It's like you're cooking. So you're cooking, you're just cooking for yourself. So you have to do everything. You have to take care of everything that you're planning uh, for, for your meal. And that may take uh, a lot of steps. But if you have here now your file, it's again fragmented, but it's fragmented in different storage. So it's like you have some helpers. It's like you are now in a restaurant. So it's not everyone, it's not one person doing everything. You have a person just to do the salad, another just to do the, the meat, another just to do the, the rice and, and so forth. So you have a final result uh, faster because it's kind of, you have more storage to use. So we have that advance that they can work uh, simultaneously. So, uh, this is something that uh, I think it, it's quite uh, nice. Julian, something that you want to add? While I'm going through all those slides. <laughs> no, I would add it if, if I need to, Luciana. You don't have to ask me, okay? Okay. It's just because I have to go through all those slides again because uh, the the tool here only allows me to go back and forth. It doesn't allow me to skip like 15 slides at once. So let's talk now then uh, about performance. And about performance, I will highlight some performance factors and some performance analysis that we 
can do in our own machines. So we know already that a lot of, uh, I've mentioned yet, there are a lot of uh, experts involved uh, in high uh, IO performance. Uh, we checked hardware, we checked middleware, we checked uh, in the application, so the high levels, the higher levels of uh, what can uh, be affect, affecting uh, the IO performance. And we have some ways to detect that performance. One way, of course, you, you, you know from the previous session is Darsha, but you have different uh, other uh, tools. There is a mouse here. Uh, and then you can have, for instance, uh, you can just run the same application with different I.O. configurations, and then you have an idea about what is the application access pattern. And then you can use simulation techniques. You can use modeling. So there are different ways that you can assess and evaluate uh, your I.O. performance. And here, just to make it clear for you, you don't need to read everything that is here. I just want to have an idea about how many things are impacting in the performance of uh, your program, of your application. So here we have a list of performance factors. If you want to uh, see the details of each one, just go to the, uh, to, to the link here and then you have uh, at least a, a chapter, uh, at least a, a, a sentence about each one of them, sometimes even more, a paragraph. But here you have performance factors that we are talking uh, by now. So we have hardware, we have computation performance, uh, and then we have communication performance because when you are in a supercomputer, you need to go through all those nodes and then to go back, and sometimes you have to use internet. So uh, it relies on many uh, different things. And here we have, which I will focus uh, in the next slides, the performance factors that are related to just I.O. So just how can I affect I.O. performance? And we mentioned already the access patterns. And then I will talk a little bit uh, more about it, uh, about I.O. strategy, and then how the parallel file system can actually affect uh, my I.O. performance. So that's the reason we have m different parallel file systems. They have different uh, specialization and for different types of uh, applications and data. So I will focus here now in those three uh, performance factors for I.O. So first we have access pattern. And I mentioned how to access the file, if you're accessing se uh, several files at the same time, if uh, the file is saved in a contiguous way or not. So uh, this, if the file is not contiguous, you have the size of the blocks when you split the file and how many blocks you have to reconstruct the file. So you have different things that can uh, influence your I, uh, your access pattern and then uh, consequently the I.O. performance uh, of your uh, application. Then you have the I.O. strategy. Which is the I.O. strategy? It's what's the idea behind how would I handle my I.O.? So usually we have that defined by the parallel file system. But we, we have you can have these high libraries to define that uh, as well. But I will go through the details uh, in just, for instance, one is caching. So it as that I mentioned before, uh, if you just uh, kind of talking through your computer, you are generating data, and then you are saving, generating, saving, and you do it too often, uh, that's not efficient. So you have cache that you kind of uh, accumulate the data, and then when you need to do the I.O., you just do it at once, or you just do it um, less often as possible. You can have scheduling, for instance, another one that it's nice to, to mention, because uh, you might know when you need that data available. So we don't need to worry about that specific data and where that data is stored. If you don't need it now and you know that you need it in three days, so in three days you you you, you can program and you can schedule uh, to have that data. And then you know that you have that data, so maybe you, you cannot do that. Maybe. What do I mean? So if you are having that data, so it means that at that time, you need to kind of save space for that data that you know that you will need in three days. 
so that's what I mean. And late we have the parallel file system. So how the file system is implemented uh, interferes a lot in the I.O. performance as well. Uh, usually in, in the application level, we don't think about a parallel uh, file system. Usually you just use the file system that you have in our own machine. But when you go to supercomputers, uh, they think about that because it's important to choose the best parallel file system available for the type of application that you have. And uh, up to today, they are still, uh, again, working in that field and developing new uh, and better parallel file systems. So, <coughs> sorry. So, I'm talking about performance and then I talk about what can impact on your performance and specifically on, on your performance. So how do I measure? So I mentioned a little bit a model the simulation in the maybe three or four slides ago. Uh, I already mentioned Darshan, which is the tool that you learned in the morning. And I ho hopefully you can all have it in, installed uh, after Constantino inserted that um, Read me for the GitHub. You also have Grafana, which is the online monitoring, which is quite nice because you just leave your application dead and then you just monitor what's happening with, with the application. And then later you identify the pattern of your application without much effort. The price that you pay here is that you have to kind of run your application to have the data. So sometimes if, if your application takes a month to run, that's really tricky because you have to do it. And then later you have the data to optimize how uh, your application is running. And also uh, you have benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So benchmarks are specific uh, files and programs that you use to have a kind of a standard of what's happening in your application and in your machine. So usually, and then you can compare application with different applications with different machines, and then you realize, oh, my application is uh, behaving the same way as, as the other, uh, that, that, that other, other guy's application. So maybe that guy used this type of iOS strategy for his application. So probably that iOS strategy will be good for mine as well. So you can uh, kind of correlate uh, your work and your application with uh, others. The police is not for me, I promise you. So you have here. So when I'm talking about performance, so I, I, I kept this slide here because usually I, I'm... <laughs> How can I say? I, I only think about my own computer. It's really difficult for me sometimes to think in uh, HPC computers because they, they are so big, they are so powerful, they're so different from our machines. But in fact, they are not too different. They just have nodes and those nodes will communicate. And then we have in the end, a storage to save your data. But uh, here in your machine, we have just one line kind of directly. And uh, because they have many nodes, they have to uh, communicate in different sometimes speeds from these nodes. So we have switches to have that. And then you have sometimes uh, spe uh, specialized uh, I.O. servers just to handle the I.O. and not to deal with the computational part to kind of uh, see if by having a dedicated server, you can improve uh, your performance. And here, one thing that I want to highlight are the numbers. So here, uh, again, the guys mentioned in, in the morning about latency and bandwidth. So here you have latency of uh, 0.5 uh, microseconds, and the bandwidth is 50, 56 gigabits per second. And then when you go to the other level, then you have now 24 terab terabits per second. So we need to make sure you need to have in your mind that those numbers, uh, when you change from one place to the other, from one layer to the other, from one switch to the other, uh, you are losing uh, the power to um, to transfer the same amount of that data from side to the other is the bottleneck again. There, there is exactly the bottleneck. So you're losing uh, speed 
So you need to uh, make sure that uh, you are aware of that. And in this case here, just coming back, you have the values for latency and for bandwidth. And then you have the throughput, which is usually uh, a little bit uh, smaller than the bandwidth. So I will give you now, I will try to uh, convey to you a simple model of how to analyze IO performance in your own application in a quite simple way. Of course, if you are using a simple model to analyze, don't expect that the result will be the best, but at least gives you an idea. Is IO something that I should be concerned in my application or not? Is the number that I'm getting, is the speed that I'm getting, is the many days that I'm having to wait for the results to be ready. Is that reasonable for the type of application that I'm running, for the type of machine that I'm, that I'm using? So just to give you uh, an idea about how to have this uh, simple uh, number in your mind. So usually we know when you have an application, the size of the file that are transferring from one side to the other. So it's the input output file size. Uh, if you are running in a supercomputer, when you are running in a HPC cluster, you have usually to uh, identify how many nodes will job uh, you your job will run on. And then you have the runtime of the I.O. during that job that you can usually uh, obtain uh, inside your program with uh, simple comments from time and take the time prior to the I.O. and the time uh, after the I.O. I will, see, I will show you that a little bit later in the parallel uh, I.O. session. So if you have those numbers, and usually they are simple numbers, you can put something that I, I'm calling here observer throughput. And then you can compare that with your network throughput. And then you can compare that with the bandwidth, uh, the network bandwidth. And then you can see if that number is reasonable of, or not. So giving you here a numeric example, if I have, for instance, a file that it's 10 gigabytes that I'm running now in 10 nodes, and I t it takes me 10 seconds to transfer from one side uh, to the other, uh, is that good? 10 gigabytes, 10 nodes, 10 seconds? Would 10 minutes be acceptable? Would uh, one second be acceptable? So you have to have those numbers in mind. And you have them here. So you just make uh, the count of uh, the throughput in this example, and then you get that uh, your files are being transferred 100 uh, megabytes per second, per second per node. Is that good? 100 megabytes per second per node? So then you go and then you check your network. Oh, your network is just a gigabit Ethernet. So in that case, it's 120 megabytes per second. And you are get, you're getting 100 megabytes per second. That's really good. You're not getting 125, but there are other things happening at the same time. So you're getting a very close number. But if you have, for instance, an infinite uh, infinite band that should be delivering to you six gigabytes per second, and then you're getting just 0 0.1, well, then you have a problem. Then you have to inspect and then talk maybe to the manager of your network to see what's going on with your application because you're not getting uh, near, not even close what we're supposed to be uh, getting to transfer those files. Tiana, can you go back a slide? Let me know at, at a little point. It adds to the discussion that we had. Um, so there has been the question, is you know the number of servers that you talk to important, how you configure this fragmentation the segmentation that Luciana mentioned, how the data is split and distributed across the servers. How does this matter into this picture? Well, if you say, if you use, for example, a Luster file system, in the Luster file system, you have to define how many stripes, which means to how many um, object servers you want to um, split a file into. If you set this number to one, it means that basically you would have one server that you talk to. Well, is this a problem or not? It really depends on the use case. If we take this example again, here we see that we have 10 client nodes. And well, with 10 client nodes, if we talk to one server, we basically can expect 
you know, what will be the limitation of, of the throughput? Will it be the 10 network interfaces of the 10 clients? Or will it be the single network interface maybe of a single server? Yes, of course, in this case, it's be the server. So in that case, you would get only the performance that can be delivered by one server instead of 10. So the number of stripes you need to set when you had 10 nodes that try to access the same file we're using parallel IO would be, for example, 10, that at least, right? Sometimes you would set 20, but it wouldn't make sense to set it to 1000 if you had that many servers, because that would mean that 10 guys basically talk to 1000, which typically means that it's much slower. So I, in my experience, it's really, it's really a basic performance model that we put here. But with that uh, in my career and 10 years at DGRZ and so on, I can say you could answer maybe 80% of the queries that people have. And a lot of people, they don't even understand this, right? They come and say, I have an IO problem. You do this math and, and then you say, yeah, you get, yes, you have an IO problem because you get actually 0 0.1 megabyte a second per node. But they say, well, this, sound, this is so much IO, they tell us, right? They tell to me, and then I look into this, right? And to find out that they do it very inefficiently, right? So we always have to make sure, we have to ask the question, why is IO with this performance? Here we get the answer, the number is good or bad. So we get some kind of assessment, some kind of feeling. 100 megabyte per node is possible. We get one, you know, 125 is possible. We get 100, so it's good, it's done, right? Servers work fine, my application works fine. But if it's 0 0.1, the question can, is really difficult to find out. And then you can have tools like Darshan that help you to find out if it is the application that is the problem. It can be that it is also the server and there are many reasons that Luciana put at the beginning at the slides. There are many performance factors. It becomes a really complicated problem. Yeah, but keep this really primitive model in your head. Um, and I think you can answer so much more yeah, than you would be otherwise. Good. Luciana, back to you. Thank you, Julian. So here we have the example about the throughput. And if you have the number of IO calls from your application, you can also have an estimated for the latency and then you can compare with the network latency and see if that's reasonable or not. But now you're getting a little bit more uh, data from your program that you might need an application to do it, different from the numerical example that I give that is usually something that you actually already know. So uh, to improve uh, performance, we have uh, some softwares that tries to uh, hide this IO penalty. And I mentioned that a little bit uh, also in, uh, in IO strategy. So you can have caching of data. And in that case, how, how much, what are the sizes that, uh, uh, of your cache and how efficient would that be? Uh, well, how often do you need to kind of dump your cache in storage? And uh, then we are kind of trading problem of uh, memory to uh, non-volatile storage. Uh, so we need to be aware of that. And also uh, one thing that it's quite trending and you saw uh, the IO server uh, before. So you have a, a specific part of your computer that is dedicated to IO. So we try to do that overlap IO with computation because if you do that, because we have a lot of uh, more power in computation. Sometimes you might even get IO for free because you're, you're, if you just use your computation power to do the calculus, uh, you might end up again with lots of data and no place to store it. So uh, we can't um, divert some of this uh, computational power to help us in IO uh, strategies. So now I'm moving to a specific uh, part of the presentation, which is the part that I presented uh, the examples uh, for the lab that I mentioned before. And that's the time that I will open a poll, uh, a polling for you guys. So my question is, have you ever used NetCDF or do you know? Have you ever used or maybe heard of 
you have heard of NetCDF. So uh, I hope you get the pulling. Um, because the idea here is that I will go through the NetCDF uh, data models now. I will explain them, and the level of detail will have will be depending on uh, how much you already know. Um, in the lab, I assume that you know a little, and here assuming that it's someone that doesn't know quite, never, never heard about it. And then if I can go through that part a little bit faster, it will be good because then I can focus a little bit more in parallel I.O. because I can see now that I have uh, just half an hour <laughs> and time flies. So I can see here from the poll that uh, 36 people, 38 say yes, and just two doesn't uh, heard about uh, NetCDF. So I'm assuming that the majority knows. So I'll go through all those slides, but I'll go a little bit faster. And then you can ask questions in the, the ones that the, uh, are not familiar with that. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat. Julia uh, is there to uh, help you to better understand. And then, of course, later you can go through the slides. So I will talk here about NetCDF, uh, about those uh, the two big models that we use it more uh, that we use more frequently, and some uh, practice for writing NetCDF files. So NetCDF, uh, you, you have different ways to see NetCDF. You can see it as a data model, but it's also a file format, and it's also a set of APIs and different libraries for different uh, programming languages. And last time I counted, it was more than 12 different languages from MATLAB, Perl, C, C++, Java. You have a lot of uh, things that are uh, using and help your application to use uh, NetCDF. The idea of NetCDF, the NetCDF is to describe much multi-dimensional data, and also to include metadata. So that's the reason in the beginning of the presentation, when I put that picture of folders uh, and metadata, uh, NetCDF now allows us to have the metadata of the file, and then we can use that metadata to uh, find that file, to retrieve the file in the easiest way. And the metadata in that case, uh, it's we call it scientific metadata because it's uh, we have metadata, you always had metadata for the file systems, for instance, you have the size of your file, the path of your file in the file system. But this is now it's talking exactly about data that is inside the, uh, that specific uh, data. <laughs> So uh, NetCDF model is based on dimensions, variables, and global attributes. So the dimensions is when the data will vary. The variables is where I will save the data. And the attributes, it's something that I want to talk, that I want to tell about the data. So I'm I can use global attributes. I can also have uh, local attributes for the variables. So you have here the dimensions. So where the data is varying and usually in climate weather we have longitude latitude level and time so usually you have those four dimensions and then you have the variables that where you actually store your data and you can have here for instance a one dimension uh, variable a two dimension variable a three dimension variable and then you can have of course four dimension variable that what we have when you have the complete model so the variables, they are specified by their dimensions, which gives them the shape. And in the NetCDF classic model, which is the first that I'm presenting, you can have one unlimited dimension. So one dimension, you don't need to say uh, how, uh, the, 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 the total shape, the total variation of that dimension. It, it, you can vary that dimension. And uh, for the dimensions, we also have what you call coordinate variables. So we have here the variables, but you have some values for longitude, latitude. So when you save them in the file as a variable, they are just discrete 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But then you can kind of have a mirror of the values that you have actually uh, stored in your data. The values were uh, captured by sat satellite or, or for someone who constructed your data. And your 
variables have attributes and then I can also have global attributes for the file. So here is just an example. I can have unit as an attribute. I can have uh, who uh, developed that uh, modeling as, as uh, an attribute for that, who collect that uh, data for that variable. I can have a, a standard name that I want to call it. So we can just put, usually when you have attributes, they are uh, strings, they are just names, but I can have, for instance, maximal and minimal values uh, saved as uh, an attribute. And then if I need to, uh, if I have the data and I need the maximum, I don't, have, I don't need to go through all the data to calculate that. It's already saved as a metadata. So that fastened my uh, performance, the performance of my application. So here a, a little bit more about the attributes. And uh, we go down to the UML diagram. So here is, again, this is a NetDF model, which is simple, easy to use, but of course restricted. So we have here six uh, data types, and they are the common data types that we have in structured programming. And then you have what I described in the first slides. You have a file that will be your NetCDF file, who has a name, and then the file will have attributes, dimensions, and variables. And then you have with that a simple uh, model, but uh, quite efficient, that was used for many decades. But then, uh, so in this model, we store the data, and as I mentioned before, so you can store it as one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, or sometimes four dimension. So here you have an example of four dimension data. So you have already a three dimension, but then it's uh, changing with time. So it's like that you have a specific uh, longitude, latitude, and then you have a specific level, but now you're taking that specific part of the map of the globe, and then you are uh, analyzing what's happening over time. So this is what we call time series, and that's the most common uh, type of data that we have uh, in climate and weather and uh, in NetCDF files. And uh, for the NetCDF, for understanding a little bit what's happening, we have uh, CDL, which is a common data form of language, which is uh, something that I can, because a NetCDF file is a binary file. You can see that in the lab. But here I have an idea of what is inside the file. So it's really a friendly uh, way of seeing its text. So you can edit if you want. You can change things. And here you have... Uh, CDL for a specific uh, NetCDF file that has uh, dimensions. And you can see that I have time as an unlimited dimension. And I can say here that it's two currently because I can check here. I have time as a coordinate variable. And then time here has two values. So here time is being used as two. And then you have latitude that you have three different values. You have longitude that you have four different values. And the idea of coordinate variables is that this would be just let three, zero, one, two. But now I know that latitude zero, it uh, corresponds to 48.75. So I just have this uh, mapping to make my data more uh, look like more the application data that I actually have. And here you can see that I have attributes for the variables. I also have global attributes, which will be attributes for the file. So here is something like a title for that file, which convention that file is using, and uh, the creator of this, that file. And eventually after this, so everything up to here is metadata i'm not i'm not talking about it i'm talking about the data but i don't have data here i'm just talking about the data and actual data it's here so you have three values for latitude four values for longitude two values for time so we have three times four times two 24 values for rainfall so we have all the values that you need. We don't have missing values, which is that uh, it can occur. But here we have uh, all the values for all the data that uh, we intend to represent with this uh, NetCDF file. 
And here it comes then the advanced model. It's called enhanced model. It's also called NetCDF4. It's also com called common data model. There are different names, but it's uh, a better model in the sense that uh, you have more uh, uh, utilities to play, you have more things to do. So you have here more primitive types, you have user-defined types like you used to have in uh, language, in uh, structured languages, and then you have the idea of groups. So here in red, you have what is a plus from NetCDF4, which is this enhanced model. And then in black, we have the old classic model. And one thing important to say is that they are compatible. So you can from one to the other and uh, don't lose compatibility, which is important because uh, it's, you, you develop something better, but you cannot lose everything that you've done in the past. You need kind of a, a, a smooth transition. So NetCDF does that. And here you have then the difference from the classic and the enhanced model. And the tr three main differences are groups, which is a way to uh, have your data organized uh, hierarchically, it's really like a directory in, in Linux. You have those user-defined types, so now you don't rely only on the primitive types. You can have compound types, you can have very length uh, types, and then you don't have uh, to have that restriction of one unlimited dimension. So for the classic model, you can have unlimited dimensions, but you can only have one. So here in the NetCDF4 model, you can have as many unlimited dimensions as you want. So here I just put some examples of the CDLs for the main features that we have now for NetCDF4 because that odd other CDL was for the classic model. So we have groups, uh, varial length, uh, compound, and norm and opaque, and you can go through them uh, later. And here is just a big picture of the API for NetCDF. So we have here NetCDF have some uh, utilities that I will show that uh, that are available already in the lab for you to play. Uh, NC dump, NC gen particularly. NC copy is to copy from one format to the other if you want to go, for instance, from classic to NetCDF4. And then you have the libraries that you use. And then you can see the next part of my presentation will be about parallel I.O. that you can have parallel NetCDF. The NetCDF, the way it is today, doesn't have parallel uh, access, but you can have parallel access with the classic model and also with the NetCDF4. And with the NetCDF4, which is the uh, enhanced model, we have the tools from HDF5. So we used uh, something that it's, uh, or was already and to work with parallel uh, I.O. Uh, under the hood of the NetCDF4. And the classic, OK, you can use parallel I.O. It's called NetCDF. It's not as good, but of course, it's also better than uh, just uh, not having parallel uh, processing at all. And here you have some uh, tools for visualization and for web for websites and how can you store remote data. So we have uh, OpenDAP. And here you can see APIs for different languages. So in this case, here C, uh, two different versions of Fortran, C++. And here the part of a remote uh, access usually is made, uh, is developed in Java. And once you have everything, in the end, you need to store. So we will use some of those uh, applications. Uh, and that's the F4, usually under the hood of uh, HDF5 to actually store. You can also have a little bit compression to store your data. So it's just to have a, a, a bigger picture of uh, how NetCDF connects with uh, the, the environment that is inserted. And then you have uh, some uh, best practice for writing at CDF, but again, because uh, you almost uh, are comfortable using uh, net CDF, I will just skip that. You can read it later, because I want to show you now an example of parallel I.O. So the idea is, uh, let's play with parallel I.O. So uh, as I mentioned to you, we have CDF, and then you can have parallel net CDF.
So the idea is that same slide that I was there in, in the beginning of my presentation, that it's also in the presentation of the guys in the morning, you can have everything coming through one processor, one node, and then that node communicates to the others, or then you can share and then all of them can have access to your data. And of course, this is a better scenario because here you have, again, visibly uh, bottleneck. So uh, the idea of having parallel net CDF is to uh, improve performance. And then to use parallel net CDF, you need a parallel file system. So net CDF specifically, uh, net CDF, the classic, uh, model you can use uh, a tool called pnetcdf and netcdf4 the parallel io is made uh, completely through uh, hdf5 and hdf5 uses mpi io uh, so it it's kind of uh, an improved library of the cone library which is posix to make uh, input and output so we have now uh, a specialized uh, library to deal with IO in parallel. So usually when you have something that is specialized, usually it's better. In that case, it is really better. And I will show some numbers for that. But before, let's just, uh, I'm talking about uh, MPI IO. You, you, you heard a little bit about that in Chris' presentations as well. But uh, what changes when I need to work with NetCDF in parallel or in a serial, uh, serial way? So usually it, it changes too little. So we have now two different functions because if I want to uh, have a parallel NetCDF file, I need to create and I need to be able to open the parallel file. So I need I have now two different descriptions for these uh, functions, and then I have this extra uh, par to indicate that uh, I'm using the parallel version of NC Open and the parallel version of NC uh, Create. At the end of the day, the net the NetCDF file, the NC file, will be the same. It's just the way that I'm accessing and then uh, constructing that file that it changes. And then in parallel I.O., you also saw some of these with uh, Chris, you have collective and inde independent uh, I.O. So in the collective, uh, it must be done by all processes at the same time. And independent, it can be done by any process at any time. So for NetCDF specifically, we have a rule that all NetCDF metadata uh, is done in a collective way. So everything that I'm talking about the data, then the number of the attributes, the number of dimensions, the, the shape of those dimensions, everything will be done collectively. And then uh, to actually write the data in the file, I can do it uh, both ways. And then I just need to specify here. So I have a variable that I am trying to have a parallel access to that variable. And remember that variables contain the data. And then I can define if I will use this access in an independent way or in a collective way. So here I just, uh, so in the VM, if you if you can, if you could not find, uh, if you could not find the VM, this is also in the Git repository. Uh, there are links for the Git repository in this presentation and also in the lab presentation. You can download it and just check. You have this uh, file here. So during my lab presentation, I will uh, go step by step to construct a simple XY NetCDF file. Here I have a simple XY NetCDF for uh, file and then you can see that if I if I have a program in C the way I have to construct an etcdf file and I want to change that program to parallel what do I actually have to change in the code so we need here to include the netcdf par library we need to change the main because now we need arguments to uh, give to pass to the MPI uh, function Then we have here where I had NC create, now I have NC create par. Remember, I mentioned that before. You check all the, the remaining uh, of my file is exactly the same. And then here, when I have 
to define a, a variable, I have a different way to access the variable. So I need to access the variable and then uh, change the mode that I'm accessing that variable. And in the end, I just inserted the MPI finalize, and that's it. So for this specific program, of course, it's a simple program, but it's just to give you an idea about uh, how little do you change. And I just saw that uh, a question about Fortran. Yes, I do have those files in Fortran as well. So if uh, anyone wants uh, them in different language, I mentioned I have in 12 languages, <laughs> but just these the, the basic ones, but they are they start for um, a more complicated programs if you are a master in that specific language. So uh, that's all you need is, is the, the first start. And here uh, I decided uh, that I was still not really happy with those, okay, I owe, it takes too much. How, how much is too much? Okay, now I know how to create a model for my my my. My, my application and then compare with the network. What about something quite simple? Can, can we have that effect of uh, a bad practice IO and a good practice IO? What that will happen in a simple example? So I decided to uh, put up this example and uh, thank you, Julian, for helping me to, to go through with it uh, in the levels that I was planning. So uh, I mentioned to you, and also the guys mentioned to you before, about POSIX, which is the standard way to do I.O. So I have here a file that is a really small file, 16, 16K. And then I will uh, have showed to you three programs. And those programs are also available in the, in the VM. And here is the repository for the GitHub. And here is the specific part for this POSIX part. POSIX part, but you can go there and then you can uh, check all these files that are there. So those three programs, two of them are you use POSIX and one, I will do that lame thing that I mentioned in the beginning. For every byte that I have, I will open and close the file and write that byte. Open and close the file and write the byte. Open and close the file and write the byte. So I will do that 16,000 times because it's a 16K file. And then in the second program using POSIX, I will have all those files at once in just one IO call, I will transfer all of them. And then I will have the same idea, but now I will use MPI IO, which is the library that we heard that is special, specialized in do IO in parallel. Here the IO is not being done in parallel, it's done in a sequential way. So here I will uh, have this example with all those bytes in just uh, one call. And we can have here, so I just printed those programs because you can see that they are really uh, simple. And I, I thought it was nice to print because you have those colors. Sometimes insert code and you have uh, the same call code. So here is the first program. So as a, this example uh, writes every byte with a specific IO call, call for every byte. And this one, all bytes with one call. So you can see back and forth, that the difference is really small. It's just about the loop that I have to insert the data in the file, and then how many times I will call this write function. So here I will call this write function 16,000 times, and here I will call this write function, I'm sorry, uh, one IO just one time, and here I will call this write function 16 times. For each one, I will call the write function to write that specific uh, data. And here, uh, the program with MPI IO, and you can see it's also a really short uh, program. So you just initialize MPI, create the file, write the file, close the file, and end the MPI. So now let's play. We have six minutes to play premium. Let's see, because I still have to talk about research. So play with the, those numbers. So I run them in my computer, which is an Intel Core i5. So not a big deal. It's a standard laptop these days. Could be i7. So do you have any idea about the numbers, the time that uh, would take for each one of the programs to actually uh, fin finalize this writing of those uh, 16 
k uh, characters in the file. So I will give you here, because we are really on time, uh, so I can give you here an, an idea of the time. So it's really fast, I hope so, because 16K we are today using movies and then we are translating terabytes of uh, data for the climate and weather research. So hopefully we'll have something that it's so small really done quickly. But you can see here that the order of magnitude changes dramatically. So it's expected then that you would have those results reflect in the speed. So here for the first program, remember that lame one that I every byte I write with one call, I have uh, in the end uh, 0 0.1 uh, megabytes per second being transferred and takes me uh, 2.7 uh, minus 2 seconds to transfer the file. In the second case, I am a little bit smarter. I just compact everything and transfer it in just one call. Wow. <laughs> it goes from 0.1 to 99. And those numbers are in my machine. They are just uh, average numbers. So I, I didn't choose best or worst case. It was just really a simple analysis. And when I saw that I'm still using POSIX only because I compact all the data and, and I did just one IO call, it, it's ridiculous. The, how how fast it is. Now let's see what happened with MPI-IO. So it's the same fun I'm doing, the same thing that I'm doing with this late, last program, which is transferring all the bytes with just one IO call. But now this IO call is made in parallel. So I can use the other nodes, but I'm still in my machine, which is a, a, an i5. So in that case, I have just two cores to use. And the speed goes to 30,000 megabytes per second. When I saw those numbers, I said, oh my god, never use POSIX again. Only, of course, because if, it's, if a file is small, who cares if, if it's minus uh, 0.2 or, my, or minus uh, 10 uh, or 2 or 10 or 5 to, to have uh, the file transferred? Who cares? But when you're talking about lots of data, look, from 0 0.1 to 33 thousand so this is yeah it's uh, it's absurd it's shocking even for me so I, I wanted to give you something that is really tangible for you to to understand how different uh, those things they can be those programs are available there in the in the repository for you to play with so that's for that part. And then uh, now I'll talk just uh, quickly about uh, research activities and what we are doing. So, in fact, uh, in Easy Waste Project, we are responsible for the award package four, which has ESDM, which I mentioned to you prior, but also has uh, SEN uh, ST, which is uh, a, a, a kind of a DSL uh, that works quite nice with uh, NetCDF. So, we need that. Um, how can I say, interface with NetDF and then the storage. And of course, you will, we will need POSIX as well. We can have a cloud storage like S3. We can have tape if you know that the data you, you will not use it uh, now. But it's up to ESDM in this case. And that's what uh, the main part of this package uh, deals with. Uh, to it's up to yes to decide which storage is the best uh, storage for that type of data. So you need to understand what the data is all about, how are uh, your data access, and then to kind of smooth that um, uh, level that here you have directly. So now we are kind of trying to do something uh, a little bit smarter. And uh, we are uh, we are not the only ones that are doing that. So we have uh, next generation interfaces that uh, are worried about this uh, data driven reach that I mentioned before. So it's not only about uh, let's compute a lot of things and now let's save a lot of things. It's about to work together. So it's to integrate the I/O stack in the uh, computational stack as well. And uh, last. We need to, uh, I didn't mention that, and then I checked the summer school. I don't think any 
only one will mention that specifically. We always need to keep in mind when we talk about I.O., we need to talk about compression. Because every time that I'm trading data, if I compress the data, usually I will have less data. So then it will be easier for me to transfer that data from one side to the other. So we have that uh, as well in uh, ESDM. We have a, a smart library for uh, compression. Uh, of course, HDF5 and HDF4 also have uh, compression methods that they sometimes use and you don't even know that uh, they are being used. But uh, it's also a field of research that it's uh, in cur under current uh, constant development because it's something that uh, it's also of course, quite important. So for my main presentation, that uh, is it. I have here some uh, bibliography about uh, where I came from uh, with some of those borrowed slides that I mentioned to you and in the ideas. And I do have some extra slides here, but it's just about um, some other questions that uh, you might have. So we also have an appendix session here. So I am now officially one minute late. So thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Julian, because without uh, you answering the questions, I would not have made it uh, on time. But now I think we can still use maybe uh, two to three minutes to see what are the main questions and then to kind of save them for the recording. Uh, is that okay, Julian? Sure. sure. Yeah, so uh, do you want me to answer something specifically? Or, oh, thank you, Pablo. Or do you have something in mind that you want to comment that uh, you answered that people talked? And just, just one extra thing about the lab. So we will have after this presentation, the presentation from Sadie, which will uh, focus on NetCDF and then the Python. And then we have both labs. And then on Friday, we are back again because you can go through the labs. It's self-paced. And then if you have any questions, you can come uh, back on Friday and then uh, ask us uh, those questions. Uh, in particular, we can run those examples that I just print here, the codes. Uh, that's it, I would say. Julian is busy answering the, the chat. So thank you guys for participating uh, a lot. And 